Now, I want to talk a little more about the Council of 1351, the third theological council, with Nikiforus Gregoras as Palamas's uh, final theological opponent. And um, this I want to do because there's not as much uh, written about this so far. And so we'll unpack what happened at the Third Palamite Council, which summarizes, it's a very helpful thing to do because it summarizes the whole debate. Gregoras, Nikiforus Gregoras, was this great sort of Olympian figure of uh, the professor with his retinue of disciples. The sources tell us he turned up with his choir of pupils, Choros Don Mathidon. And he had the first word, uh, despite what he claims to have been the case in his own history. He and his team were concerned about two issues or questions in particular. He said that an addition had been made to the confession made by bishops upon their consecration, in which they were obliged to accept the distinction between nature and energy. And this was taken from a phrase found in the Acts, the Practica, of the Sixth Ecumenical Council of 680 to 681 which dealt with the question of or the heresy of monothelitism. And this addition was, according to Gregoras and company, theologically wrong and so totally unacceptable. Uh, actually, in an interesting way, if you take a look at my chapter on St. Gregory the Sinite and his treatment of the transfiguration in my book on the orthodox understanding of salvation, you'll see how the hesychasts made a direct connection between Christology, the language of Christology, and the language of Trinitarian theology, meaning that they said if each of the natures in Christ has its own proper, natural, and essential energy, then his divine nature has a divine, natural, and essential energy. If his divine nature, the divine nature of Christ, has a divine, natural energy, then the Holy Trinity God, the Holy Trinity, must have a divine, natural energy, right? Because the divine nature of Christ is the divine nature of the Holy Trinity. You see? They're not inventing something there. They're just applying to Trinitarian language what we already have articulated in terms of orthodox Christology. So the natural energy of Christ's divine nature is divine and uncreated. So the natural energy of God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit is divine and uncreated. And this entered as you can see, the confession made by bishops upon their consecration. But Gregoras and company didn't like that. They said that it was, it was wrong. How can you come to that conclusion? I mean, it's more difficult to see how Gregoras came to that conclusion than how the Hesychast came to theirs. But you know without going into all the details, you know how compartmentalized 
Western theology has become. It is true that Christology is an item of its own. And you switch, you switch to different areas of theology and each area has this kind of self-enclosed, subsistent characteristic. Be that as it may, the Gregoras and company objected to this. That was the first point. The second point, they said that certain doctrines associated with Palamas were not acceptable to them, especially those related to his iconoclasm. Somebody asked me whether it was all right to pray before icons, because we had said that hesychastic prayer is uh, non-conceptual, non-imaginary, non-iconic. You don't accept images, right? But when we say that they don't accept images in prayer, we don't accept images presented to us by our mind, by our imagination, or from the enemy. We're not talking about praying in front of an icon. Look at the Hesychast. Look how many icons they had. There were icons everywhere. They had their own iconography, right? Which actually conveyed the Hesychast spirit. In 1374, Patriarch Philotheos Kokinos sent Theophanes the Greek. You know, there are two El Grecos. Theophanes the Greek went about a century earlier than the El Greco who went to Spain. And they both took with them the spirit of hesychasm. In El Greco who went to Spain, he took, because they discovered, in recent years, they discovered, among other things, an icon that had been painted by El Greco, and lo and behold, it was of the Hesychast tradition. He took that with him to Spain. But Feofan Grec went to the Russias about 1374, about 100 years earlier, and took the whole spirit of the Hesychast um, movement, or re re revival, if you like, into uh, Russia and the Slav Slavic lands. But Gregoras did perceive the rejection of images and uh, the imagination and the, the workings of the... Uh, rational aspects of man as iconoclasm and said, ah, we have something of a Messalianism here. Now, it seems that the opponents of hesychasm regarded the hesychast objection to naturalism. What the, what the hesychast objected to in religious paintings was naturalism what they call physiocratia, naturalism. In, in other words, the naturalistic depict... The, the Greeks had been brilliant, right, at depicting nature. Their knowledge of anatomism, anatomy and the created world to this day is unsurpassed. The hesychasts objected to that not because that was bad in itself, but because it was not pointing to the world to come. It's a depiction of this world, of fallen man. What the Hesychast strove to do was to point towards regenerated man, transfigured man, deified, glorified man. Remember, again, the great... Irenaeus of Lyon, Gloria Dei vivens homo. The glory of God is a man who is truly, really and truly alive. 
And a man who is really and truly alive is one who has the vision of God. The vision of God is his life. So that's the perspective of the of the Hesychas vis-a-vis iconography per se. And so Gregoras and company thought, ah, this is iconoclasm. It's a rejection of a style of iconography that points to this world instead of giving us an iconography which is, as people say, windows into the kingdom of heaven, into transfigured man. Now, after two days had passed from the 28th of May, the second session took place and the anti-Hesychasts were allowed to speak, the sources tell us, as much as they wished. They were allowed to express themselves freely, so there was no form of coercion. If you read Gregoras's account, it's like one complaint after another. But we have independent sources which tell us that that in fact was not the case. One might argue that after the council had made its decision, there was a kind of coercion because there was pressure placed on the anti-Hesychasts to, to accept the decision of three councils. You know, the, the emperors were <laughs> exhausted, they were exasperated. How many times are we going to deal with this, this question? But the main topic of concern were the terms Theos and Theodis. Theos, God, and Theodis, divinity or Godhead. Do these two terms mean the same thing? When we say Theos, what exactly are we referring to? What are we saying? Is Theodis the same as Theos, or is there a difference? So, St. Gregory arose to reply to the question of these two terms and say that they, they did not signify the same thing. Theodis, he argued, referred to the energies of God, mainly. But as he arose to speak, the main protagonists on the anti hesychast side left, and they didn't want to stay to hear him. So St. Gregory was left at the council addressing his own disciples. Gregoras claims that he had said as much as he could and that he was unwell and therefore unable to stay longer. He makes similar claims in his later writings uh, as well. And the next session took place on the 8th of June. At first, the anti-Hesychasts wouldn't come, and then they agreed that they would come, and they accused Palamas now, this time round, of diatheism and polytheism. Where do we find all this information? We find it from the Tomos of the Council of 1351, written by Patriarch St. Philotheos Gokinos, who is the one who sent the iconographer, uh, Phil van Greek, to the Russias. And it was later added to the Synodicon of Orthodoxy the decisions of this council, and it was accepted by the whole church. And this tells us who was there and who took part and what took place on the first day, etc. As the Thomas tells us then, on the following day, so on the 9th of June, a fourth session took place. And on this occasion, the anti hesychas said, that they too had a confession to make. And St. Gregory, addressing the council, said that this question had already been settled with the Council of 1341. 
And already in the Council's second session, St. Gregory had made a very important and extremely helpful distinction. The distinction is between the words, the Greek words, andilogia and homologia. So literally, andilogia is a contradiction. Right? Anti, contra, logia, diction. You say something, and then I say something against what you said. That's an antilogia. But an homologia, it's a debate. But an homologia is what the anti-hesychasts said, a, a confession. And when the anti-hesychasts had said at one point that Palamas in his confession had said such and such, but that now he was saying something different to what he had said previously, Palamas retorted that it is one thing to make a confession and quite another to contradict. In the case of the former, one is obliged to formulate one's dogmatic opinion with exactitude and clarity, while in the case of the latter, one may speak somewhat more freely using terms that you would not necessarily want to use in a confession, such as in the symbol of faith, the creed. And so, in the case of an andilogia, a contradiction, a debate, if it is demonstrated that one's opinions are wrong, then one would retract them and come to different views and opinions. So debates, an exchange of ideas, opinions. So in the end, Palamas's confession was adopted, his homologia was adopted by the council after they had gone through a series of contradictions or let's call them disputations, a series of andilogias. But the emperor, who was knowledgeable of things theological, ecclesiastical, a rare thing nowadays to find such a, such a leader, right? He recognized that, in fact, the dispute had not come to an end. So he decided to call what the sources referred to as another synod, ali synodos, which Meyendorf regards as a separate and distinct council. This is a minor point, but nevertheless, at this time, the word synodos could have two meanings. And in this case, it did not signify that there was another separate council. What it means is that there was another session of the same council. We don't have four Palamite count. This, this is just... This is just a few days after. You don't, have, you don't have another council just a few days after you've had a council. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So the fifth session was in fact called by the emperor who wanted to put this whole controversy behind him once and for all. Because among other things, this was disruptive to the life of what had been left of the empire which was dissolving fast enough as it was. So the sources say that a few days passed after that time and an additional fifth session of the council took place, probably towards the end of June in 1351. Although the anti hesychasts initially refused to attend again, the emperor commanded that they attend because, as he saw it, many important dogmatic themes had been brought up in discussion. And so I want to break down for you the six questions that the emperor, John VI Cantacuzenus, very astutely asked the participants 
to address. The first one is whether the distinction between the essence and energy of God exists. That is to say, whether it is a valid distinction. The second, given that the distinction is real, of what kind is the energy of God? Created or uncreated? And the answer given by the Hesychasts, of course, is that the divine energy is, is uncreated. The Emperor's third question was, how is it that having identified the divine energy as uncreated, we nevertheless do not regard God as composite? In other words, how is it that the belief in the existence of the uncreated divine energy does not do violence to the simplicity of God. The answer given here, of course, was to the effect that the divine energy does not constitute a separate entity, something that exists by itself and apart from God himself, but that it is rather the product and fruit of the divine essence. It is, as we said before, it's the essential energy, it's the energy of the essence. So it exists together with the essence and is from the essence, but is not independent of the divine essence. The fourth question was whether the term theotis is not only employed to refer to the essence of God, but also to his energy. Is the term theotis used only in reference to the essence of God? Or is it also used for the divine energy? The debate showed that it was employed by the theologians of the church to refer both to the essence of God and also to his energy. When, for example, St. Gregory the theologian says, Theodis, he's referring to everything that denotes the oneness, everything that pertains to the oneness of God. The one essence and the energy that flows from it. And it's very in interesting that he does that and the way that he does that. So, it's, it refers both to the essence of God and also to his energy, and indeed that it was used more by them to refer to God's energy, while for God himself, God in his essence, the term theos was most suitable. Number five, whether... Theologians see the divine essence as in some way superior to the divine energy. Remember, this was the one of one of the main accusations of Gregory Akindinos, that Palamas accepted two divin divinities, one superior, the other inferior. And during the debate that ensued, it became clear that the theologians who preceded them regarded the energy of God not as inferior to the divine essence in terms of status, but because in terms of causality it issues forth from the essence, it may be regarded as following after the essence, just as the Son of God in the doctrine of the Trinity is from the Father in terms of causality and so is second in terms of causality but is not second in terms of his essence. So it is also with the divine energy which is second to the divine essence in terms of causality but not in terms of divine status since the divine energy is nothing other than the action 
or operation or life of God himself. And so it is not fair to accuse St. Gregory of diatheism. And finally, question six was, since we participate in God, is this participation a participation in the essence of God or in his energy? And the debate demonstrated that our participation in God is energetic and not a participation of the divine essence. Otherwise, that would make us consubstantial with God, the Holy Trinity. Now, the Thomas was signed by uh, two emperors at the time. First by John, John in Christ our God, faithful Basilefs and autocrator of the Romans, Cantacuzenus, and he had to add his family name because the other emperor, his son-in-law, was also John, but John in Christ our God, faithful Basilefs and autocrator of the Romans, Paleologos. In fact, Paleologos was not there at, at that time. He was in Thessalonica, and he signed the Thomas about a year later. Callistos, another friend of Palamas, was patriarch at the time. Uh, he succeeded Isidore, Isidore with the Vuhiras, his family name means he had the hand of a, the hands of a, an ox, Vus, Vuhiras, must have had large hands in his family. And he signed the Thomas, and it was added, as I said, to the Synodicon of Orthodoxy. But the Thomas was also signed even later, probably in February of 1353, so a couple of years later, by another emperor, Matthew Asen Cantacuzenus, the son of Cantacuzenus, and whose mother was from the Asen dynasty of Bulgaria, who in 1353 was made co-emperor with his father and his successor.